It's no secret that the Lakers were a train wreck heading into the NBA trade deadline. They were on the outside looking in in terms of the playoffs and even the play in. They were an extremely poor three-point shooting team. Athlete Davis missed 20 straight games due to injury and the Westbrook situation took an uneasy turn. With all of this being considered, the Lakers knew they needed to make moves and did so in what some might call a fleece because not only did their moves provide them with much needed depth and spacing on the roster, but the cost of doing so was pretty minimal given the protection on the 2027 pick. In this video, we'll discuss how the Lakers came out as potentially big winners in the NBA trade deadline, review what went wrong in the whole Westbrook saga, and foresee how exactly these moves potentially catapult them to contention status. But before we begin, be sure to leave a like on the video as each like makes a tremendous difference for the channel. And also, be sure to sub to the channel for even more content like this. The Lakers headed into the NBA trade deadline with a loss against the OKC Thunder, which was also the night that LeBron became the all-time leading scorer. And while this is obviously an accomplishment that should be celebrated, the Lakers looked completely lost in that game. Not only that, losing against a team directly above you in the standings when you're playing for your playoff lives does little good for you. Darvin Ham blamed the lack of day school play and poor offense due to players trying to feed LeBron the ball to break the scoring record. But the truth is, this game demonstrated who the Lakers have been all season. They're outscored 36-6 in the first half on three-pointers, and they also shot north of 60% from three in that first half as well. Anthony Davis was inexplicably not aggressive when the Lakers definitely needed more from him, and another 35-plus point performance from LeBron wasn't enough to carry the Lakers. Just to be clear, this is not to say that in any way that OKC are a bad team or don't have a nice young core. But keep in mind that the Thunder were quite literally on the second game of a back-to-back -back where they lost by nearly 30 points to a Curryless Warriors. With that type of performance, the Lakers definitely were obligated to make some moves. And Rob Linka and co. actually did an excellent job. In a three-team deal, they're able to acquire floor spacing and depth with D'Angelo Russell, Jared Vanderbilt, and Malik Beasley while only surrendering Russ's contract and a top four protected 2027 pick. Just so that we're on the same page, the Lakers weren't in a position where they could just let Russ's contract expire and reap 47 plus million dollars in cap space. They wouldn't have all of that cap space to begin with, and with Rui needing an extension in the offseason, the Lakers would have way less money than they'd hoped for. So, the next logical step was to trade that $47 million for players that can help you now, and players that could potentially be extended. One of those players is D'Angelo Russell, who obviously isn't a stranger to the Lakers organization and is an upgrade at point guard over Russ. Over his last 30 games, D'Lo has averaged 19 points, 6 assists on 47% from the field, 89% from the free throw line, and most importantly, 42% from 3 on 8 attempts a game. Mind you, half of those attempts are catch and shoot threes, where he shoots 39%, and he's also dangerous as a pull-up three-point shooter as well, where he also shoots 39% on the season. Given his floor spacing and primary role of facilitating as a guard, D'Lo wrecks defenses in ways that Russ simply couldn't in the Lakers scheme. LeBron and AD would definitely welcome playing next to a player like D'Lo for his ability to play on and off the ball, and a player that's been a much better finisher at the rim than Russ has been this season. He does average fewer assists than Russ does, but if you're simply judging someone's playmaking ability based off of total assists, then I question your understanding of the game of basketball. D'Lo's calling out of Ohio State was his playmaking ability, and his ability in the pros has definitely been overlooked. He's honestly one of the more gifted playmakers in the league as someone who operates well in the pick and roll, he can drive and kick, and sets his teammates well in the half court and transition. Is he an otherworldly defender who can lock up the best guards in the league? Well, obviously no. And he will be an unrestricted free agent come July. 
However, the pros of D'Angelo Russell for sure outweigh the cons, especially considering that he was just one of the few pieces the Lakers brought back in that deal. In that Russ deal as well, the Lakers received Malik Beasley, a double-digit scorer who has shot 38% from three throughout his career on six attempts a game. Additionally, Jared Vanderbilt was an amazing pickup and is a huge reason why I consider the Lakers to be a big winner in this deal. Vanderbilt was coveted by many teams heading into the deadline, primarily for his cost control contract and defensive versatility as a long athletic frontcourt player. But now, the Lakers have him as a much needed presence in that front court, and he also helps them in another area, rebounding. At 6'9 with a 7'1 wingspan, Vanderbilt averages 8 rebounds a game with two of those being offensive. Overall, given the Lakers only had to part with the 2027 pick and also got a 1-4 through four protection on that pick, this deal was a deal well done. I completely disagree with the narrative that there was some vampire in the locker room with Russ or that he was some locker room cancer in any way or form and it's sad that people are trying to spin the narrative in that way. While Russ wasn't an ideal fit, he gave it his all on the court, he was always first in practices, he adjusted to a six-man role that I never envisioned that he'd be willing to do, and it's not as if the roster particularly catered to his strengths. However, the Lakers had to make a move, and his expiring $47 million deal was the way to do that. The Lakers would also make some moves like trading Thomas Bryant, which was a move I really wasn't fond of at the time, but I later came to understand it given that he was the one who wanted out after a lack of playing time. The Lakers also dealt Patrick Beverly for Mo Bamba, which was a money-saving move more than anything. So, with all that being considered, where do these trades put the Lakers down the line this season? Well, without even having practice as a team, they pulled off an impressive win at Golden State on national TV with the new additions and look solid. However, given that the Lakers are in a deep hole right now, it will take a lot just to make it into the play-in game. LeBron's foot injury could potentially derail him for the rest of the season, Athy Davis is clearly not 100%, and there will be a gelling period to see which lineups work and which lineups don't. Lakers did give up a mind-boggling 17 threes just in the first half alone to the Portland Trail Blazers a couple games ago, and free throws continue to be this team's Achilles heel. But if they remain healthy, and if LeBron and AD prove to be the dominant forces they can be, then the Lakers are a team that no one might want to face come playoff time. With that being said, be sure to let me know down below how you guys feel about the LA Lakers. What do you feel about the Westbrook trade, and how good do you think the new additions can be for this team? And with the new additions, how scary do you think this Lakers team can be come playoff time? Are they legitimate contenders? Let me know in the comments section down below. Be sure to leave a like on the video as each like makes a tremendous difference for the channel. Also, be sure to sub to the channel for even more content like this. We're going to be talking about the OKC Thunder, the Golden State Warriors, and more in upcoming videos, so you don't want to miss it. Hope to see you all in the next one, and stay tuned.